pray, Father, for strength. We pray, Lord, that you would build compassion and love in us. And that you would help us as your people during this time to be your people in such a way that people would see you. And with that in mind, we pray for our country. This week, coming up, is midterm elections. And to say that our country is divided would be an understatement. So first and foremost, we pray for justice and righteousness. We also pray for peace. We ask you that you would change the hearts of your people in the church, that there would be an awakening, that there would be a sensitivity to your leading, and a growing in, in our hearts for the love of Jesus, that it would might be evident to a country that is very divided, very angry. And so in the midst of all this, we pray for our leaders. We pray for wisdom, guidance, that we might live quiet and godly lives as you command us in scripture. And that uh, your kingdom would come and your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Pray for all of the people who are at the polls and watching the polls that there would be no um, incidents, any, certainly no violence, and that instead there would be an opportunity as Americans to exercise the freedom that you've given to us for a few hundred years. So that by the end of the day, that we would stand in your blessings with hearts that are open to the gospel. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we are back in Colossians, and I realize that I am not moving at a blinding speed. <laughs> First of all, you can blame that on the Apostle Paul, yeah. and you can blame it on whoever you want to blame it on. It's, um, I will pick up the speed, but as I looked at it, this week, it's like I'm almost pushing myself past myself, and it's like, you no, know, you just gotta lay all this foundation. So if you've been with me for a while, which most of you have, you can see that I'm very big at laying the foundation so that you can understand how everything else fits. Colossians is about Jesus. What better topic? But I started by saying, it's not only about Jesus, it's Colossians had a problem, a couple problems. One of which is they had some bad theology, and the others wish they had some bad philosophy. And Paul's going to get around to both, but in order to fix both, he has to present the right Jesus. Or using modern term, not the fake news Jesus, but the real Jesus. I say, well, how do you know you've got the real Jesus? How do you know you've just not signed up for a religion, but that you actually know Jesus, who's God, who came in human flesh? who we will see face to face. That, to me, just blows my mind right there to know that, by the way, this is a freebie, okay? So Jesus came and he took on a human nature. It means he's totally 100% <coughs> man as well as 100% God. And that happened at his inception when the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary and she conceived. And some miraculous way, God, who by nature is God, picked up another nature, which is human, and glued them together. He doesn't tell us how but all within a one person of Jesus who's fully God and fully man. And that happened at his conception, and then his birth, and then he lived a life for only three decades, and then he died on the cross as fully God and fully man. And when he rose out of the grave, it wasn't a spirit that rose out of the grave, it was Jesus who rose out of the grave, 100% God and 100% man. So he ascended into heaven and said, I'm coming back. So he's still 100% God and 100% man. And when he comes back, and he is coming back, 100% God and 100% man. Here's the mind blower. Forever, 100% God, 100% man. That's the mind blower. It's like, well, if you came to do a task and you need to be human to do it, I get it, but as soon as you're done with that, get rid of it. No, 100% God, 100% man, forever. Which means when you see Jesus in that resurrection body that the apostles once saw, he's gonna have a nose and eyes. 
I don't know if he's going to have hair because it's all the perfect heads don't have hair. <laughs> Amen. And that's a mind blower to me is that this concept of Jesus, I'm actually going to be looking into his, his eyes. And that is an amazing thing. It's the real Jesus. So Paul started by saying that in verses, well, he didn't start this way, but in verses 15 to 19, he says that the real Jesus is actually fully God and fully man, but that he's the image of God. He's the actual likeness of God. He's actually God, which means he wasn't born or created. Remember my definition of a cult, a Christian cult is that which claims to be Christian, but in some way denies the full deity and full humanity of Christ. You can't be biblically Christian if you believe Jesus was created. Even if he's over man, still under God, that's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus is fully God and fully man. As the Holy Spirit is fully God. As the Father is fully God. It's only Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is fully God and fully man. I mean, two natures. 100% God, 100% man. That's really bizarre. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those are all three persons co-equally God. It's not a pecking order of God on the top, the Father, then the Son, then the Spirit, who sort of does the homework. They're all totally co-equally God and eternal. So we have one God in three persons, and that's not illogical. It's just out of our realm of experience, because we're one person, right? We're human, and there's only one voice inside, hopefully. So one nature in three persons is out of the realm of experience, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. And it makes total sense if you think about it, because I think everyone would agree that God is love. I mean, even people that don't want to acknowledge God will tell you that God is love. If, I would hope. Certainly, the scriptures say God is love. The concept of love makes no sense whatsoever if there's not an object to that love. Think about that. When you love, it's always you're loving somebody. So now you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-equal, existing eternally in a love relationship. So you can say God is love. He knows what he's talking about. Father loves the Son, Son loves the Spirit, they love the Father. If God did not have more than one person, if it was just God the Father and the others, Son and Spirit came to be, that would have meant you had an eternally existent single person in love with himself which would be the, I would say, the infinite expression of narcissism. So we would have a narcissistic God. So the fact that God is love, and that love has any concept whatsoever, argues for a plurality of those persons. And it's not logically contradictory. It doesn't break monotheism, because it's only got one nature. No, oh, that was free. Because <laughs> I want to make sure we got the right Jesus. And the right Jesus is going to be fully God and fully man. And so if you can't get that part, the rest of it makes no sense. But then as we go on, and I'm going to pick it up, well, verse 19, and yes, I know I'm going so, but I'll pick it up. Not today. I'm going to just go a little bit today. A lot of stuff, a little bit. Here we find that the real Jesus also came with a purpose, and that is to reconcile everything. Reconcile means to fix. We know what reconcile is. We have it in English. But to, to fix everything in heaven and on earth. So it says, for in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's verse 19. Look at verse 20. And through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself. So that, now the fact that he's reconciled means something's broken. That's why I say it's faith. You don't need to reconcile if there's not a broken relationship or a broken whatever. So through him to reconcile to himself all things. Well, let's be really specific here what all things are. Whether in earth or in heaven. Well, that goes back to our whole long study with Amos. That's the whole two-stage approach. It's not just what's happening on earth. It's what's happening in heaven. It's broken in heaven. Well, that's news. Well, yeah, of course it's broken in heaven. There's a war going on. There's been a rebellion going on. This archangel, Lucifer, decided he wanted to be the Godfather. And Isaiah 14 says in those big five eye worlds, basically, I will ascend above the clouds of God. I will sit above the stars of God. I want to be God. And Ezekiel 28, in prophetic language, says it's because there was pride in your heart 
you walked in the Garden of Eden, you were the gateway to God, but pride was found in your heart, and you decided to rebel. So evil was born in the breastplate of an archangel in the presence of God. There was rebellion there. And he took others with him. So that's the context of how we came into this creation. So this is rebellion taking place, but then it's spilled over into this planet because God creates this couple that was in the garden and gives them only one command, which is don't eat of that fruit. And of course they broke it, and when they broke it, that ushered in sin, ushered in death, ushered in all the problems that we know, things got broken. So things are out of order in heaven and on earth. But it didn't surprise God. It's all part of his plan. And so he had to fix things, and Jesus put the fix on. I thought it was funny when I thought of it. So Jesus is the fixer-upper, and he's going to do that at the cross. Because the cross is going to deal with not just our sin and our brokenness, but also the brokenness of heaven. Because that's where he defeats his enemies, at the cross. So Jesus, who assumes the second nature and dies on the cross, actually became, becomes the one who fixes all things in earth and in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's where it happens. This story is amazing. It's taken God thousands of years to tell this story. It started in a garden, then it's continued with the sinfulness of man and the flood, and the, he picks up people, and then they go into captivity, and then they come out, and then everybody's you know, disobeying, and blah, 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 blah. That's a Hebrew term. <laughs> Till Act 2, Scene 1, this shaft of light comes down from heaven, I made that part up, and lands on this little baby crying in animal's feeding trough. He's arrived, the fixer. And he's going to reconcile things not just on earth, with the people that God made in his image, but in heaven as well. It's an amazing story. And that's not even near the end of it. And we're living in this story. Okay, so why does all this matter? There's a couple questions that we wind up asking in life. Uh, one of them is, where did I come from? That's always an awkward question for parents. The answer, every guy in the room knows the answer is, ask your mother. <laughs> right? The other question, once we figure out where I came from, is what am I doing here? What's my purpose? And then if you get past that, it's like, well, how do I do that? And what kind of challenges do I face? And how do I get equipped for a career or a profession? And then sooner or later, all of a sudden, it's like I'm looking backwards at that instead of forwards to that. But they're the same common questions. So part of the answer is, part of why we're doing this today and understanding Jesus is also to understand what we are and what we do. So let's go for it. But you won't understand it unless you recognize that everything's broken. Broken. Maybe broke too. All right, so let's look at verse 20, a little closer. Here we go. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth and heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now I'm going to inject some theology. This is the part of the foundation where you can say, okay, we need something to build on here. This is all talking about our purpose, our being, who we are. All comes back to Genesis 1 and verse 26 and verse 27, where it says that we are created in the image of God. Imago Dei is how it would be put. So look at Genesis 1. Everything always goes back to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. I would say image and likeness are synonymous in that case. But somehow we're made in the image. And that's what I want you to hold on into your head, but I'm going to give you a couple verses before I go back to that. We see it again in Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 to 3, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. The image and likeness are synonymous. Let's go forward. Genesis chapter 9. And in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, so this is now after the flood, it's taken into account, you're not allowed to go kill people. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed, for God made man or mankind in his own image. So we keep seeing it. 
But Psalm 8, there was a little bit of curve to it. Now that we're in his image, what is that going to mean? So Psalm 8 is a, adds to that picture. And so if you go with me to Psalm 8, and I'm going to pick up verse 5. It's talking about, well, let me go back. What is man? What is man that you are mindful of him? Remember I said that's etched over the Emerson School of Philosophy in Harvard Yard, right? This, that's Ira. Every time I pass it, I would kind of chuckle to myself. There in the middle of the Harvard Yard, the philosophy building is etched in stone. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Perfect. The son of man that you should care for him. Now here's the key verses. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crown him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over your works of your hands and put all things under his feet. So there's our function. So there's our purpose. There's a dominion function. There's a ruling function. There is a, we become agents of God. So part of the image of God comes to the fact that we are to be his agents. So go back with me for a second to Genesis chapter 1. I won't make it keep skipping around. Fill a little Hebrew lesson. Never mind. And God said, let us make man in our image, look at the English word, in, after our likeness, look at the Hebrew word, after, words after our likeness. Now, I've always said that theology is cut on the little words. So see the word in our image. The Hebrew text about the, what you do is you put a preposition at the front of that. That little preposition can be translated a number of different ways. And the same thing is in English. It could mean he made it in our image, for our image, as our image, according to our image. And you say, okay, big deal. What's, well, it winds up being a big deal because as people have looked at what does the scripture mean when it says we're made in God's image, it basically the discussion falls into three different categories. If you follow me, I'll tell you why. That's important. You'll see it. Category number one is it could be that substantially we're kind of like God. Now, most of this position will say, well, not that we have a body, but those who hold this position will say, well, we have his creativity, we have his moral nature. I'm sure you've heard this. In fact, this has been the popular position. It's like we have his moral nature, his creative nature, we have the ability to think and to reason, and always with this particular um, position, you're separating the body and the soul or the material and the immaterial. That's how the church wind up very early on saying the body was bad and the inside was really good, which is not um, actually true. So that's the substantial view. It's like, okay, on the inside, we're kind of like God. The, the problem with that is experience tells us that's not always the case. So for example, um, I have this great dog well, man has this great dog. We call him genius because he is a genius. And genius has not just the ability to think and to reason and to be creative. He also has a will that can be quite pernicious. Yesterday at the dinner table, he was training me. <laughs> I didn't realize it until its master, man, pointed out, Dad, don't look at him. He's training you. <laughs> because we had fish soup for dinner, and fish is his favorite, and he goes for the weak link sitting at the table. <laughs> and that weak link is me. Now, he had not reason that. He had to come up with a strategy. So his particular strategy was obedience unto death. <laughs> so I say sit, he went and sat right away. I said lay down and went right away. But he was creative enough to stick his nose right next to my leg so that I could feel him breathing <laughs> on my leg. That's pretty good, but he's not made in the image of God. Yet he can reason, he can creative about it, he can think about it. And I'm like, uh, okay, so yeah, all of it is true. You know, being in the image of God does have creativity and reason and so on. But it's not just people that have that. You know, there have been work with gorillas in the 1970s and beyond, and parrots, that they can build bodies of vocabulary, and can talk and reason, and do the same things, and no one would say, well, 
who is supposed to say that they're man. But here you have the ability to think. And the reverse of that is also true. A child in the womb, right? Let's came all the way back to before the first trimester may not have the fully developed ability to think and create and to see color and all the things that are creative and not even the expression of the will is in place. But yet, the Bible treats that as human. That is human. And yet it doesn't have the ability to think. So there's something about the image of God that is more than just thinking and reasoning Billy, you understand my point? So some have said, well, the image of God is really a relational kind of thing. So by being in the image of God, I can relate to him, a relationship of love, and because of that, I can relate to other people. So relate, that comes from a theologian um, named Karl Barth in the 20th century, very influential. But in this case, love is the foundation. I'm in the image of God, so we have this love fest going on, me and God and everybody else. But then there's a third option, which is what I'm going to be reasoning for here, is it actually includes the other two, which is part of its strength. It doesn't deny the reason and the creativity and even the relational love fest. But it adds to that, and that is if you take that little preposition on the front, and instead of regarding it as the word in, in our image, treat it as the word as our image and likeness and give it a functional sense, which is perfectly possible in the Hebrew text, and I would argue is the best way through this. It's like, okay, God creates us functionally, or some would call that vocationally, in his image, which means not just that we have a reason and ability and creativity and that we're in love with him and relationship, but we're also here as his representatives. We have a mediatorial function, which is really the context of Genesis 1, in Genesis 2, he tells us then to do what? Be fruitful, multiply, rule over the earth, and subdue it, which he repeats again after the flood. So you are my agents here on earth. So to be human is to be an agent of God. Oh, that changes dynamics quite a bit, because he doesn't say that to parrots. Neither does he say that to gorillas. But there's something about being human that puts us in that functional category. Now, sometimes I look to see what's the enemy doing. So if you look at what the enemy's doing, that often tells you when you could be on the right trail. Because if God is saying something, the enemy is sure to be counterfeiting it. And so it is with this case as well. And it's like, OK, we're talking about functioning, mediator. I'm a representative of God. That's what idols are. Now, let me dispel you of some stuff that you may have picked up along the way, and probably because the Bible itself treats this with a lot of sarcasm and cynicism about making idols and bowing down to things that are wood and things that are stone. That's on purpose in the Bible to make fun of that. Look at you bowing down to the wooden idols. But the reason why the wooden idols became idols is because the people that made those idols believed that that wooden object became the local mediating point for the spirit that is beyond. In fact, in two different places, both in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, we have well-recorded understanding of what's called the opening of the mouth ceremony. You dress your idol, you bring it about, and then ultimately there comes a point when you beckon the idol to beckon the demon to take residence in this idol. It's called the opening of the mouth ceremony. In fact, in some cases, they would go through a mock ceremony of cutting off the hands or the arms of those that made the idols to say, oh, I didn't have anything to do with that. So what the people that were making the idols understood is that, no, this wood and stone actually invites the presence of these demonic hosts. Now all of a sudden, the people don't seem so stupid after all because they're actually calling on demonic powers and that this idol now becomes a mediator. Look how important it is in the face of what God actually got. God looked at us and said, I'm gonna breathe my breath of life into you and you will be my mediator here on earth. And now we go ahead with an opening of the mouth ceremony, breathe our breath into an idol to become a mediator for a demon who's in opposition to God. Wow. You see that? No wonder God's mad. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Wonder why that is at the top of the list. 
So here you have this mediator kind of sense so that we are not just in the image of God, if you would allow me to just change a little bit, we become imagers of God as an active sense. We are his mediation, his representative. And then he gives us control over the earth, rule over the earth, and subdue it. And by the way, he gave that to all mankind. So if you are human, you are in that position. That goes a long way when it comes to arguing things like what is human, when do you become human, what is our goal as humanity, and that people have stewardship over the earth. There's a concept of being mediating God's justice and his righteousness. No wonder God holds Israel and all nations, we've just been through Amos, accountable for justice and righteousness. This is a big deal. So functionally, we are as representatives as the image of God. So that doesn't contradict we have creativity and reason and moral judgment. It just includes that. And that's what Psalm 8 was about. What Psalm 8 is talking about us ruling on us. We have that first Corinthians says from verse 3, it says that someday we will actually rule over, we will judge the angels. There's this role that we take that God has given us. There's huge implications of this. All right. Let me skip forward. So Jesus, we are say, in the likeness of God. Jesus is God. So we are creating according to the image. He is the image. And this is what's going on here with Paul with Colossians. So let me go back to Colossians. So you got the right Jesus. He is the image of God. Again, it's going to have huge implications for him. For him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And then he's doing this process. So he is the image, we sort of have the image, and he, what does he do? He reconciles all things in earth and in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. How many times have we gone to the future, we're gonna get here when we cover Colossians 2, but 13, 14, and 15, and you were dead your trespasses and circumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with him, having forgiven our trespasses by canceling them, record of the dead, sin against us with this legal demands, all that's fancy talk to say, at the cross your sins were forgiven. But verse 15 says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now what that's saying is the cross does double duty. It not only defeats our sin nature, but it also defeats the devil and his host. So Jesus, the image of God, comes to fix all things in heaven and on earth. He comes at the cross to make things in heaven and on earth right as the image of God. But there's another implication of that. So, if we are God's uh, agents and we are to act like God throughout the world, then it makes sense that only those who are redeemed are actually equipped to do this job. Let me put that in another way so I don't lose you. It's like, okay, we are the people who are the world's doctors. And if the doctor has the plague, the doctor's not going to be any good. So even though all of mankind is created in the image of God and has this responsibility, you're going to look at the world wrongly unless you know Jesus. Let me try it another way. This week, coming up, is a midterm elections with a country that does not see Eye to eye. And that's not just believer or unbeliever. It's just, it's just an illustration of division. But there is a completely diff different world views of what things are supposed to look like. And I would venture to say, you scratch your head more often than not, and you say, why doesn't anybody see this? Why can't we see this? It goes back to the thing. It's like, look, if you know Jesus, you're going to have a different set of lenses. You're going to look at it differently. If you know Jesus, you're going to be a doctor that has a cure, not the problem, which is why I want to introduce you to one of my favorite guys in history. His name is Ignaz Semmelweis. Now, why anybody would call you a kid? Ignaz, if your name is Ignaz, please forgive me, but can you imagine? You go through the whole birth process, and mama, she's just got labor upon labor, and he picked a baby and said, oh, what's his name? Ignaz. Father named that child. 
<laughs> Ignat Semmelweis in the 1840s. Ignat Semmelweis was a Hungarian physician practicing in Vienna, Austria. He was the doctor who became known as the one who saved motherhood. And he was delivering babies in Vienna, Austria, and he noticed that the mortality and illness rate was very, very high. Ignaz, some advice, had this theory that if you would just, if the doctors would just wash their hands with this solution, of, I forget what it was, it was some sort of chemical solution, but it was a disinfectant. Wash your hands, the death and mortality rate among the women in Vienna, Austria, where he's practicing, went down to under 1%. So you gotta, you got to be, in my case, I'm sure you, it's an analogy, you redeemed to be able to fix the patient, even though you, you might have doctors, that's everybody being in the image of God, only ones that wash their hands are the ones that should be delivering babies or you're going to be giving death. The problem with poor Ignatz is nobody believed him. Isn't that the case, right? So he's trying to say, the scientific research shows Wash your hand, but the problem was there was no scientific research. That didn't come about later until you have Louis Pasteur and this guy named Listerine, <laughs> Joseph Lister, who then put the groundwork to what poor Ignatz was saying decades before, and they showed this thing called germs, which you can't see, which is what was killing people and being transferred from the doctors to the women who were giving birth. So what did they do? They persecuted Ignatz. And ultimately, he went nuts, and they put him in an insane asylum where they beat him up, and he ultimately died from his injuries, which is a sad story, but I can't tell it to you any other way. So Ignaz Semmelweis didn't become a hero until long afterwards, but in our analogy, he's a hero because he represents the doctor that washed his hands, those who are in the image of God, who are redeemed by the Savior, who can then govern the world in a pattern in which the Lord intended. That's the image of God. It's the role of the image of God. And it takes Jesus to do that. But we still live in a world infected with sin. All right, let's go forward. Verse 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body and flesh by his death in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. Now all of that is he's looking at the Colossian church and he's reminding them that they're the doctors with the washed hands. You were alienated and hostile, hostile in mind. That means you were infected too, doing evil deeds. But he's reconciled in his body of flesh. That's a fancy way of saying he made peace with God through the cross. Remember, we're going to go to Colossians 2. And because of that, we have peace with God. Or he has made us holy and blameless. That's another way of saying you washed your hands in this chlorine so solution, whatever. So that we are now above reproach before him and able to do our job as the image of God. And this is the role of us as believers, it's the role of us as the church, and not just as individuals. Now, I'm not saying here that this also means that um, uh, the church's role is to make Rome a better city. I have said that before, right? I said that our role is to proclaim the gospel. Live the gospel. And when I say proclaim the gospel, I'm talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm not talking about all the effects of the gospel. I'm talking about the person of the gospel. Here's the good news. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again. This is great news because it deals with the fact that we have dirty hands and hearts and lives. This is the good news of the gospel. He died so that we don't have to. But it wasn't just his crucifixion. It was his resurrection. Don't forget, they're bookends. But we have a tendency especially if you have an Italian mother, to point out all the areas in which we have sinned. And so we can tell people, you're a sinner and you need to have Jesus in order, and here's all the ways in which you've sinned. Which, unfortunately, a lot of times, those that go in the name of Christ have a tendency to point the finger at everybody else's sin. You, you follow me? I'm trying to say this in a nice way, but I think you all know what I mean. And we have a reputation for doing that. We cut the love out, and we're very good at pointing figures, and we forget the resurrection. I said, how many times? It's like, you know, the disciples never got in trouble, really, for preaching the crucifixion. 
They got in trouble every time for preaching the resurrection. The resurrection is that says you can step out of the grave alive and then it's defeated and so is the kingdom of darkness. And that is really good news. Why do we save it for Easter? Why don't we tell the people who are most suffering, the most painless, emotional, physical, whatever, there is life after death. This is just a passing. This is just a flash in the pan. The second that you die, you will be seen Jesus, who, by the way, is 100% God, 100% man, and all the theology, you forget the theology, you just go, I just saw Jesus. That's really good news. That means when you die, you will live. That's the gospel. Our role is to preach the gospel. Our role is to preach that Jesus came, Jesus died. If you believe in him, you will have everlasting life. He loves you. He will accept you. He will indwell you by his spirit. He makes you this thing called the church. He'll wash your hands so that you can be a doctor to other people. Use your spiritual gifts as the body of Christ builds itself up in love. See how I'm mixing all these metaphors together? You got the picture. That's our job. Our job is not to give Rome a new septic system or to take the lead out of the water. Now that's a good thing, and being good stewards of the world, it falls under our responsibilities, and that's justice and righteousness. But you can't have justice and righteousness without Jesus, and that's where the problems come. Christianity has been pushed, oftentimes, to a position of your job is to make the world a better place. But don't bother me with the exclusive that Jesus is the only way. <laughs> because we live in a culture that says every way is fine. And so we want the benefit of the gospel, but we don't want the author of the gospel. And so when the church follows that, it's like what I would say is Jesus didn't come to make Rome a better place. He came to set the captives free. But it is part of our responsibility for justice and righteousness. That is the persistent widow. You know the position the persistent widow? I won't look at it for time's sake, but remember, who gave teeth? So she's constantly after the judge to rule in her favor. The judge says, even though I don't know this woman or believe in God, or not, even though I don't know God or believe in him, I'm going to give this woman what she wants. And so it's told to us that we ought to pray with the persistence of this woman, which is true. But it's the end of the parable, which talks about the fact that she was praying for justice and righteousness, and this is what God expects of his elect. What is if the Lord will find this kind of faith when he returns? What does that mean? It means it should be on our hearts to be the image of God, to pursue the justice and righteousness, because that's the effect of Jesus, his kingdom, and his righteousness. Let me put it all together, because we're done. Can you believe that? Come back with me to Colossians 1. I'm going to pull it all together. It's like making a ship in a bottle. Here's the time when I pull all the strings together. For in him is the fullness of God pleased to dwell. That's Jesus. Because he's God and completely man, he was able to do what? Reconcile to him, to himself, all things. Everything's broken. It's broken by sin. We're broken. The country we live in is broken. Heavens are broken. Whether it's earth or in heaven, how did he do it? He made peace by the blood of his cross. And we were once like that. We as people, as church, but we're not like that anymore. We're doctors whose hands have been washed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Ignat Semmelweis. Mostly thank you, Jesus. Because he's reconciled through his body and his death so that we can now have washed hands. We're holy ladies and we can now be the image of God. And unless you're redeemed, you will not see the world as God sees the world. And all your good efforts are going to come to nothing. I don't care how many councils we have, how many sit-downs, how many round tables, what's your opinion, what's that opinion, what book you publish, and who's got the best camera on them. None of that is going to lead to the right place unless you've got Jesus. I'm sorry, but that's the reality of it. But I'm not sorry because it's open for anybody who wants it, anybody who believes. And though Jesus is the only way, it's not a restricted way. Anybody can come to Jesus. I believe in him. That's what he means in verse 23. If you continue indeed in your faith. He's not talking about, oh, here's a thing. If you don't continue in your faith, you go to hell. That's not the context here. And we can deal with that another time. He's basically giving him a pep charge. Continue in your faith. It's hard to do this. It's hard to be a doctor when you're seeing everybody in the world dying and you know you've got the cure. <coughs> so keep it up. Live in the faith. Be 
be stable, be steadfast, not shifting the hope of the gospel which you heard. So we live in a crazy culture right now. Don't have to shift off the message. The message is Jesus. Let me repeat that. The message is Jesus. Can I say it again? The message is Jesus. There's life in Jesus. He loves you. You belong to him. He paid for you. Believe in him. Which you heard. Which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven in which I, Paul, became a minister. Which you are all now doctors in the image of God with. The knowledge of God with the role of Jesus with the job that it's your job to go out there and deliver them babies for the kingdom of God. But make sure you wash your hands. Got it? We thank you, Lord, for this amazing grace. So what we ask this week is that you help us to live that out with the love of God, to live that out in such a way that people see you in us. And we pray that, we pray for our country, and we pray for your church. We pray for an awakening as the images of God to point to the image of God, Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen. Closing song uh, today is brought to you by Paula Dennery and the uh, Brentwood Baptist Virtual Choir and Orchestra and Travis Cottrell. In Christ alone, again, you are welcome to stand if you would like. Uh, in Christ alone.
let that be our closing prayer. What a great, what a great song. Uh, it, it ties in very, very nicely to that message. Thank you so much for being here. Make sure you encourage someone uh, on your way out of the door. Thanks again. Yep. Oh, that's great.